In this video, I'll discuss the practical applications of the CAPM. Then I'll discuss the importance of alpha, which is a measure of security or portfolio performance. And then I'll show you how to calculate alpha and beta using real world data. Now let's get started. In the last video, I covered the model form of the CAPM. Now I need you to understand the regression form of the CAPM, which is this. The regression form of the cap m is the form we're going to use to actually calculate alpha which is the symbol the greek letter alpha and beta all right so again we have our expected return on stock i but unlike the model form where the risk-free rate was on this side i've just moved it over to the left hand side and we're adding two additional components we have our alpha which is sometimes called jensen's alpha uh, this is going to be one of the most important metrics we have for indicating whether a security or a portfolio outperformed the market for its level of beta. Uh, the middle component here you've already seen, it's just beta times the market risk premium, which is the expected return on the market, minus the risk-free rate. And then lastly, we have E sub I comma T. This E is an error term. It's the model error for stock I at time T. Uh, the, this is expected to be zero, but this is kind of the error term for when we actually start to use linear regression, or uh, OLS. Uh, so what you're going to see is that this will essentially be the value that makes both sides balance for every single observation that we have using real world data. And a final point here, this expected return on the market, this is going to be assumed to be the, the expected return on the S&P 500 index, uh, just because the S&P 500 is seen generally as the, the market in the United States. All right. Now, so if the cap M is true and this model is perfect, what should we expect of the alpha? in this estimation. Well, if alpha is our measure of outperformance or underperformance, then having cap M actually be perfectly predictive of expected stock returns, or in this case, expected excess returns, our alpha should be zero. I mean, if the cap M is a perfect model, then this alpha will essentially be zero or uh, as you'll see, you know, it'll be right around zero. All right, now let's graphically take a look at what we're talking about here. So at the end of our last video, I showed you the security market line. Well, here's an example where, again, we're plotting the expected or required return on the y-axis, and we have the beta on the x-axis. And we have, again, our security market line that starts down here at the risk-free rate, and its slope is, again, the market risk premium. And these alphas that you see here, these alphas represent by how much a specific security, let's call this uh, security I, how much these securities outperform or underperform what they were predicted to offer in terms of returns over the period. So this security, security I, outperformed the market by uh, well, some positive amount. This security, let's call it security K, underperformed the market for its level of beta, its level of undiversifiable risk. In other words, these alphas, they tell us whether or not a stock outperformed or underperformed the market. Now, if the cap M were true, all of these alphas would be zero, and these points would just be directly on the security market line because uh, the the capital asset pricing model would perfectly predict stock returns, the actual stock returns, and not just the expected stock returns. However, in the real world, what we get is something like this, where the, the alphas are either positive or negative. All right, let's try an example. In this example, a portfolio manager earned a return of 10%. The portfolio's beta is 0.5, and for the same period, the market return was 7%, and the average risk-free rate was 4%. Uh, Jensen's alpha for this portfolio was closest to, and we have some choices. 
All right, let's find out what Jensen's alpha or the, the alpha was for this portfolio over this period of time. Uh, to do that, I'm going to move over to Excel. All right, I'm over here in Excel and we have our question and we have the regression form of the cap app. So let's use that to solve this problem. All right, so we know that the portfolio beta was 0.5, and I'll go ahead and just put in all of our information here, uh, 0.5. We know that our market return was 0.7, so this is the expected return on the market. 0.07, I suppose. Next, we know that the risk-free rate, RF, was 4%. And last year, the portfolio manager earned a return of 10%. So in this case, expected or actual return on the market was 10%. So Let's calculate Jensen's alpha for this. I'll zoom out a little. And one other point, I mean, we have all the other variables. We have the return on the stock. In this case, uh, we know that this is an actual return. So our expected return on the stock is, uh, we'll just plug in our actual return of 10%. I'll convert these to percentage terms. Uh, we know that our risk-free rate was 4%. We know our beta is 0.5, our return on the market in this case was 7%, our risk-free rate was again 4%. Our error term here, and I know I've hinted at this already, but our error term is generally assumed to be zero. The average error in our model is always going to be zero. All right, so let's go ahead and calculate our alpha. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this stuff on the right-hand side over to the other hand, other side, and I'll start off by getting our excess return on our stock. So the quantity of our return on our stock minus the risk-free rate. So in other words, I'm just solving for this. And we're subtracting from that the quantity of our beta times our market risk premium, or the return on the market minus the risk-free rate. And our error term is also zero, but I'll just put in zero here. doesn't matter. Uh, so when I plug this in, hit enter, what we're going to find is that our alpha, in this case, was 4.5%. Uh, so I just had all the other information here, and I just used algebra to solve for our Jensen's alpha. Now, what this 4.5% alpha tells us is that this stock, or in this case, this portfolio, outperformed what it was expected to offer in terms of return by 4.5%. I mean, this portfolio had a beta of 0.5%. And therefore, it would have had an expected return of a certain value. But instead, it outperformed that expected return by, well, 4.5%. This positive alpha tells us that this fund outperformed the market. All right, let's try one more CFA level question. And then we'll actually get into regression. All right, so which of the following is most likely to be the primary determinant of expected return of an individual asset in the CAPM? Uh, I didn't write this one myself, so I apologize for the, the uh, poor grammar here. In this case, we have three choices, the beta, the standard deviation, or the risk premium. Well, let's start off with uh, answer choice B. Well, the standard deviation really doesn't apply with the cap M. Remember, the cap M just says that our expected return on a stock is equal to the risk free rate plus the beta times the market risk premium. Well, I at no point when I was describing that model did I mention standard deviation. So answer choice B is not correct here. Uh, choice C, 
the risk premium. I mean, every asset in the market is going to have the same risk premium. Uh, so it's, I mean, it's not C. I, I, I think C is just one of those distractors that they put in there, but doesn't really make any sense. The answer here is B. And the reason it's B is because our beta, remember this is our model form of the cap M, is driving our expected stock return. The higher the beta, the higher the expected return on stock I. Uh, yes, every stock will have to take into account the market risk premium, but that market risk premium will be the same for every stock. The only factor that changes across stocks is the beta. So the answer is A. Now it's time to use regression to estimate the cap M alpha and beta. Now to do this, I need to mention a couple of parts here. So I, I've already mentioned that there's two forms of the cap M. We had the model form, which was really clean and it didn't have an alpha or an error term. And then I started off this video mentioning the regression form of the cap M, which is this. Now, the reason we have the regression form of the cap M is because we're going to be regressing the excess return on stock I on the market risk premium, or rather the, the excess return on the market in this case. Uh, in other words, what we're going to be doing is taking one variable. This will be our Y variable, and we'll regress it on another variable. This will be our X variable. This part, the left-hand side, this is going to be our Y variable or our dependent variable. If you remember from all the way back in like pre-algebra, you had Y equals MX plus B. This is where it starts to come in handy. This is going to be our dependent variable, and we're going to use our independent variable, aka the excess return on the market, uh, our X variable, to predict our Y variable. Now, what regression is going to do is it's going to identify the alpha and beta that reduce the sum of squared errors. In other words, it's going to find the alpha and beta. Well, it's going to assign numbers to each of them that minimize these error terms. So you'll see that these error terms won't always be zero. They'll be positive or negative for each observation. But uh, the goal here of regression and what the computer is doing is it's finding an alpha and a beta that when added to this formula and you plug in the ret the excess return on the market for this observation and get this uh, this excess return on the stock, uh, minimize the errors over the course of the data set. Uh, so rather than me trying to reiterate this, let me just show you how it works. All right, so let's move over to Excel. So I have some data here and I've cleaned it already for us. And this data is data that consists of monthly returns for both the S&P 500 and the company Microsoft. We have 60 months worth of return data. So this is monthly return data for the S&P 500 uh, index, or rather the ETF, and the uh, monthly returns on Microsoft over this five-year period. I've also included the risk-free rate at each point over uh, during each month of this uh, five-year period. All right, now to use the cap M, what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to calculate our excess return on the stock, in this case, Microsoft. So we're going to need to take the return on Microsoft stock and subtract from that the risk-free rate for every observation, every month. Then to get our other variable, our X variable, we're going to take the return on the market, AKA the return on the S&P 500, and subtract from that the risk-free rate. Again, this is just the, the T-bill rate that I've already collected. So let's get started. Let's do our X variable first. So we're going to take the S&P 500 raw return and subtract from that the risk-free rate that I collected from the uh, Federal Reserve. Okay, there we go. Our excess return on the S&P 500 in August of 2016 was negative 14 basis points. 
our excess return on Microsoft was just the return on Microsoft over that month from start to finish minus the risk-free rate during that period, aka 23 basis points. All right, now let's just go ahead and copy those all the way down. So now we have 60 observations for our independent variable, the S&P 500 excess return, and 60 observations for our dependent variable, the excess return on Microsoft. Now we're ready to run our regression. Okay, so what we're going to do is go up to the data tab and go over to data analysis. Now, I know I've shown you how to do this in these videos uh, twice already, but just I'll show you how to do it again. If you don't have the data analysis tab, you need to go up to file, go down to options, go over to add-ins and Excel add-ins, and make sure that you have checked both the analysis tool pack and the analysis tool pack VBA. Uh, VBA is just a programming language that's kind of the back end to Excel. All right, so when you click OK, then you should be able to go over to the data tab and you'll see this data analysis tool pack. So click it and then scroll down to where it says regression and click OK. And now you can start to enter your input data. So our Y range, that's our dependent variable. So I'm going to highlight all of our return data or our excess return data for Microsoft. So just cells H1 through H61. And then our X range is just going to be all of our data, including the label, uh, G1 through G61. And then because we have labels in the first row of each of these uh, arrays, I'm going to check labels. And then I'm going to put our output range, we'll say here. Uh, just, well, I'll put it in cell K6. And just so you can see the residuals or those error terms, I'm going to check the residuals box. You don't, you don't need to do that, but you know, it helps you to understand the data that we're working with. So I'm going to actually, I'll check all of these. What the heck, why not? And I'll click OK. And now we have our regression output. All right, so let's go over what this output tells us. There's a lot of output here, uh, but there's really some of these data points are more important than some of the others. The first thing that we are interested in is uh, we'll start with the R squared. Now the R squared is essentially the explanatory power of our model. Uh, what it tells us is, so the R squared, if you don't remember from your stats class, it's a number from zero to one or 100%. And it tells us how much of the variation in our dependent variable is explained by the variation in our independent variable. So in this case, about 28 or tw yeah, 28% ish of our, our independent, our dependent variables, uh, volatility is explained by our independent variable. Uh, so that's actually pretty low. I mean, if we're saying that the cap M is the end all be all model or perfectly predicts stock returns, this number would be close to a hundred percent or one, uh, since it's not well, that, that tells us that there's something missing here. We'll talk about that later. The next part of this output that we need to understand is the intercept or the coefficient on the intercept. Now this, this is our alpha. I'll just put that there. And this alpha, it tells us that Microsoft outperformed the market based on its level of systematic or undiversifiable or market risk. In other words, Microsoft had a beta in this case. Uh, this is the beta. The coefficient on the variable is the beta. Uh, so Microsoft had a beta of 1.09. And based on that beta, should have had an expected return of something or other. And it outperformed that expected return. In other words, this alpha being positive indicated that 
Microsoft did outperform expectations. Now, whether or not that is statistically significantly different from zero, that's answered here with the, the p-value. Uh, now, each of these output components, the standard error, the t-statistic, and the p-value, will tell us whether or not our security outperformed the market. In other words, these numbers tell us the result of a statistical test or a hypothesis test where we assume, or the null hypothesis is that the intercept or alpha is equal to zero. The T statistic is fairly low, and the P value, which is probably the more important one here for our purposes, is fairly high. Now the P value essentially tells us whether or not, or the significance level of this, uh, this coefficient. If the p-value is less than 0.05, this, well, we can reject the null hypothesis that the alpha, or in this case, it's, it's also the intercept, equals zero. Now, notice here that our p-value is 0.4338. What that tells us is that we can't reject the null hypothesis that the alpha is equal to zero. In other words, we can't reject the null hypothesis that this stock did not outperform the market. All right, now let's take a look at the beta. Our beta of 1.09 tells us that during this five-year period, or these 60 months, Microsoft had slightly more than the market average uh, undiversifiable risk. Its p-value, which is again the result of a hypothesis test for whether this beta is going to be equal to zero or not, this p-value is extremely small. I'll convert it to a number just so you can see how small it is. So it's got a small p-value and a very high t-statistic. Now what this tells us is that our value here, our beta, is statistically significantly different from zero. Uh, so in other words, we can reject the null hypothesis that our beta is equal to zero. Uh, this, uh, we can reject this null hypothesis at well beyond the 1% level. Uh, in other words, this p-value being very small tells us that this beta is absolutely, uh, absolutely greater than the expected beta of zero. In other words, this variable, the S&P 500 excess return, does offer some prediction ability for the excess return on Microsoft which is to be expected. I mean, the, the market return or the excess return on the market will uh, generally be able to predict the excess return on whatever stock we're dealing with. All right, so these are our alpha and beta. Our alpha is positive and our beta is 1.09. Those are, I mean, really these three are the most important parts of our regression output in Excel. Uh, but down here, we have our residuals. And our residuals tell us essentially what the error term is for every observation, all 60 observations. Uh, so if you were to add this residual into this equation and plug in this as your excess return on the market uh, with this beta and this alpha, you would get this excess return on Microsoft. So in other words, these are the uh, the values that make our entire uh, set of obser observations balance. Uh, so again, here's our, our excess returns. Uh, notice here that the error terms for each of these observations is, are either positive or negative, uh, and then the predicted excess return is just a straight line because, I mean, we're using simple linear regression. It gives us a straight line uh, with an intercept 
at the alpha. All right, so that's that. All right, now let's try a slightly more complicated problem where we use the cap M and we calculate the alpha and beta. And then what we'll do is we'll build a portfolio containing two stocks, Apple, and we'll put 75% of our funds or our assets in Apple, and then we'll put 25% of our uh, assets in Boeing, and we'll see what our portfolio beta is and our portfolio alpha too. All right, so let's get going. All right, let's see what we have here. So just like the past, the last problem, again, we have 60 months of return data for the S&P 500. The stocks here are Apple and Boeing, and I've also collected the one-month T-bill rate. So we're going to calculate the excess return on the S&P 500, the excess return on Apple, and the excess return on Boeing. And then we'll run the cap M for both Apple and Boeing. And then we'll calculate the portfolio alpha and portfolio beta, where the weights are 0.75 and 0.5, or 0.25. All right, so first things first, let's get our excess returns. Our excess return on the S&P 500 is just the raw return minus the risk-free rate. Next, our excess return on Apple is just the raw return on Apple minus the risk-free rate. And then finally, our excess return on Boeing is just the raw return on Boeing minus the risk-free rate. And I'll copy all of those down. All right, now we're ready to run our first regression. So I'll go over to data analysis, click on it, select regression, and now I'm in the input section, and let's start off with Apple. So in our first cap M regression, we're regressing the excess returns on Apple on the excess return of the S&P 500, the market risk premium. And I've got labels highlighted in each of these rows, so I'm going to check the labels box to tell Excel that that first row is full of labels. And then I'll output our data. Uh, let's try and keep this right here uh, on cell L9, and then I'll click OK. All right, so now we have our first regression output, and we know that our alpha, in this case our intercept, is positive, certainly not statistically significant, and then our beta in this case is 1.2149-ish. Uh, so it's slightly, it's got slightly more undiversifiable risk than the market as a whole. Next, let's go ahead and get our alpha and beta for Boeing. So again, I'm going to go up to the data analysis tab. And really, the only thing I need to change here is my y variable, our dependent variable. And I'm going to put that data, we'll put it way over here right next to our other data. So we'll say like right here on cell W9. And click OK. And now we have our alpha and beta for Boeing. Uh, positive alpha, beta very close to one. All right, now we are ready to calculate our portfolio alpha and portfolio beta. Now, I've already mentioned in a previous video that the portfolio beta is just the weighted average beta of your portfolio. But the same thing is also true for your alpha, your portfolio alpha. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the weight of Apple in our portfolio and multiply that by the alpha of Apple, in this case the coefficient on the intercept, and add to that the weight of Boeing, in this case that was given at 0.25, and multiply that by the alpha of Boeing. So cell X25. Hit enter. And now we have a monthly alpha of 33 basis points. 
Next, we'll get our portfolio beta. And that's going to be just the weight of Apple, so 0.75 times our Apple beta plus 25% times our beta of Boeing. And so we'll hit enter here. And now we have our portfolio beta. Uh, so that's that. I mean, we have our, in this case, this is a monthly alpha. And this portfolio beta, this is just the, the current beta. It's not, a por it's not a monthly beta or an annual beta. Uh, it's just the beta. It's essentially the amount of undiversifiable risk this portfolio is exposed to. Now, if we wanted to, we could scale up our monthly portfolio beta to an annual portfolio beta. Uh, basically, we'd just take 1 plus this 33 basis points to the power of 12 minus 1. And basically, our, our annualized alpha would be about 4%. All right, so what should you be able to do now? Well, you should know how to calculate alpha and beta. I mean, that's essentially simple linear regression. You should know how to use simple linear regression in Excel. If you don't, please ask me. Uh, reach out because that is very important. Uh, I mean, you can really use any statistical program to do that. I just chose to use Excel because it's, it's more visual. And I mean, I feel like everyone should know how to use Excel at the very least. Uh, in the real world, if you're a financial professional, you're probably going to be using R or Python or maybe SAS or Stata to run those regressions. Next, uh, you need to be able to cite the basic assumptions upon which the CAPM relies. Uh, so we assume efficient markets, we assume there's no transaction costs, and we also assume that all investors can invest in the same assets. Next, you need to understand why we care about the CAPM. And that's pretty simple. Basically, the CAPM is our primary model. It's the original model that predicts expected stock returns. So if we want to use it in valuation work or uh, we want to, let's say, use it to predict stock returns, we can. Now, it's by no means the most accurate model empirically, but it is the original model. In a later video, I'll discuss some of the other models that have come up since the CAPM. Uh, now, finally, you should know the testable implications of the CAPM. Uh, so, for example, what should the actual alpha be if the CAPM was true? If the CAPM was able to perfectly predict expected stock returns with 100% accuracy? In this case, we would expect our alpha, the amount by which the stock outperforms the CAPM or underperforms, uh, to be equal to zero. Now let's recap. This is our regression form of the CAPM. And the CAPM essentially states that there is a single risk factor that perfectly predicts excess stock returns. That single risk factor is the expect or the excess return on the market, although otherwise known as the market risk premium. In practice, we use historical data on the return of the S&P 500 and the return on our given stock to calculate that beta and the alpha over the same time period. The alpha indicates whether a security outperformed or underperformed expectations based on the amount of undiversifiable risk the firm uh, was exposed to. Finally, I mentioned that portfolio alphas and betas are the weighted average of the component alphas and betas. In other words, we calculate these alphas and betas of portfolios the same way we calculate portfolio returns. We just take the weights times the alphas or the weights times the betas and sum them all up. All right, so with that, I'll wrap up, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you.